That's right. I'm going to ask you questions and you're going to answer them. <laughs> Just like an interrogation. Just like that. <laughs> but you've buttered me up because you brought these amazing gifts. Yeah, Look at well, this. you know. You, can I, how do I even Oh, just this? the little latches at <laughs> right. the side. So right, so this insane cake. Yeah. Oh my God. What it's, is in this? So it's, well, good stuff. It's obviously vegan. It's it's German uh-huh. chocolate cake. I used to be the pastry chef at Sante for five years on right. the Brea. So it, even though it uh, looks decadent, and it is, it, I don't use oil. I don't use sugar, at least not refined sugar. Uh-huh. It's all made with dates and there's no salt. And it's pretty dark. Darn good, actually. It looks pretty amazing. Yeah, so. I think you'll like it. I want you to like we, it as much as... Yeah, the thing that stood out for me, Rich, most in your book that I remember the most is when you talked about when you detoxed and you ate your first blueberry mm-hmm. and it was like the best blueberry ever. Right. I hope this is like the best cake ever for you. I think this might exceed the <laughs> taste of a simple blueberry, but you know, that's amazing. So I should refrigerate this. Yeah, at right? some point, refrigerate it. It'll be fine now, though. And then you also brought me this. What is this? That's, some my, kind of that's like- my rock and nut crunch. That was actually the first product I created created out of culinary school. And again, it's it's just nuts, seeds, and fruit. That's it. Uh-huh. Looks amazing. That's good. It's All good right. for athletes because I know athletes yeah. need more concentrated calories. I'm not going to eat it now because yeah. I'll be chewing on my yeah. gum. It'll be very noisy, up, actually. There. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so uh, it's great to see you. Thank you. We are uh, back here again. You were one of the original old guard on the podcast. Yeah. I think it was episode 50 something, wow, 53 yeah. it, or something it, like that back in like 2013. It I was think. a while back. It was yes. amazing. Thank you for having yes. me back. Of course. Yeah. I'm so excited to talk to you. And I think, um, you know, the best way to kick it off is to kind of share a little bit about your story. I mean, I know we dug into that pretty deeply the first time you were on, but the show has grown quite a bit since yeah. then. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who who, who were not aware that you were on the show. That's right. Even Initially. Even- <laughs> and your story's great. I mean, it's so um, empowering and inspirational and, you know, your transformation is, is really you. something else. So, Thanks. So tell me about that. Okay. So or where should I begin? Born in 1960 in Chicago to a morbidly obese mother and a normal mm. weight father. And you probably know that when you ha- your parents are obese or overweight, you you're yeah. more chance of becoming that. And, and so I got fat when I was five years old and I lived in Chicago and I don't remember because I'm a little bit older than you, maybe a lot. Growing up, <laughs> you don't look at that. Well, thank you. I'll be fifty-eight in three weeks. But in the nineteen sixties, there weren't a lot of fat kids, and so when people tell me now, you can't understand what it's like to be fat because they mm-hmm. see me as a slender person. I was fat before it was socially acceptable to mm-hmm. be fat. Nobody was fat. There was one fat kid in every grade in nineteen sixty 1960 to nineteen seventy. That was me. So maybe I wasn't as fat by today's standards. But when you're the fattest one, you're still the fattest one, and there's a lot of things that go on with that that are not comfortable growing up. Like for instance, you can't buy your clothes at a regular store because they don't fit. And so became fat at five, but by 11, I was actually obese. I weighed 160 pounds and I'm five, six. At 11. At 11, but I wasn't five, six then. I wasn't even five feet then. So I was obese. And, uh, you know, it's not fun and it doesn't matter how fat you are. It's still, it's not fun if you're fat and you're uncomfortable in your own body. So I didn't realize that I was actually suffering from what I know today to be a food addiction, an addiction to refined foods, specifically things like sugar and flour. And I continued to become fatter and fatter. I got into about the 200 pound range in my twenties, but I was vegan. This is the weird thing. Mm. I, I, at the age of 17, when I was a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania, I was studying to be a veterinarian and instead of became a vegetarian because the first day on the job, I was handed a tank of live salamanders and the doctor said to cut their heads off. And I said, why? He goes, well, we're doing protein lens regeneration experiments in the amphibian and I just need their eyes. Well, I was on scholarship and there's something Mm -hmm. about, you see a guy in a white coat and I cut off one head and I was like, terrible. I started vomiting. I went to the student health center and I said I would never eat another animal again or harm one or wear one. So I became a vegan on Mm -hmm. September 1st, 1977. Yeah. Not cool back then. Yeah. (laughs) That was 40 years ago. And I imagine not easy either. No. no, Oh, we didn't even have powdered soy milk in 1977. Now you can go to any town anywhere in the United States, 99 cent store, Walmart, and you get plant milk in probably 10 different varieties, oat Mm -hmm. and soy and rice. There was nothing. Well, there wasn't nothing. There was whole natural food like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains and legumes and nuts and seeds, but that's not what I ate. Right. I was a sugar addict. I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, starting every day with a Coke Slurpee with eight pumps of vanilla syrup and having a Dr. Pepper Big Gulp, 48 ounces every day of lunch, not exactly a health-promoting diet. Right. 
So I did this every day till I was about 43 years old. 26 years of my veganism was basically eating candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream. Uh-huh. And uh, so of course I became, <laughs> those yeah. are, I, of course I became- During obese. that period of time, were you trying to resolve this issue? Like, were you going on diets and trying to restrict your calories and doing all the things that, you know, we do? Yeah. So I tried this one diet in my teens, which was called anorexia, where I right. didn't eat and I actually ended it's up- effective yeah, for yeah. a while. Oh, it, 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 it works yeah. beautifully. <laughs> it's just not a lot. It's not sustainable, you know? Mm-hmm. So I tried that in my teens and ended up hospitalized. And uh, so that wasn't good because there were so many complications. My hair fell out, my nails, you know, I, I developed an enlarged liver. That wasn't very fun. But the thing about anorexia is the minute I started eating again, I didn't start eating the way that you eat and I eat now. I went back right away to the junk food. And then I gained even more weight. And actually what a lot of people don't know, and they'll find out in my book is I actually attempted suicide Mm -hmm. because then I became bulimic. And in a lot of ways that was worse than anorexia for me because I didn't like being anorexic, but there was, it wasn't that hard. So in other words, to be anorexic, all I had to do was not eat. But bulimia required extraordinary efforts because the binging and the purging and the laxative use and the over-exercising, bulimia was a 24-hour job. So was anorexia, but anorexia, you're basically cold and tired. You don't have any energy to do anything. And so that's when I attempted suicide at the age of 19. And I never told anybody this, not even my husband until about three years ago. Yeah. I mean, I read that in your book (laughs) and I was like, wait, I don't think I knew that. We didn't talk about that last time and I'd never heard you speak about that. It's not something I was really comfortable talking about, but then when I started... uh, when I spoke at the McDougal conference, he insisted I tell my life story. And I didn't think it was fair to leave that out, especially since coming out as a food addict or food addict in recovery now, so many people have written me saying that they've contemplated suicide and attempted suicide because of their discordant relationship with food. So I figured, well, I'll tell people, yeah, it was a dark period in my yeah, life. Yeah. So walk me through that a little bit. I mean, you know, what, what, I mean, I can't imagine yeah. the level of despair. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It's like, I, I try, I, I remember the day at April 1st, uh, you know, um, and I, 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 it's funny because I, and I, I don't usually think about this, but it's interesting because I, I do personally believe in God. I know a lot of people don't, but that's the only explanation for why I'm alive because I didn't tell anybody. I didn't even leave a note and I had stolen, um, I never had to talk about this. I, my grandfather was a medical doctor and I stole medicine from his house. Um, my grandfather, my grandmother was diabetic. She was on a lot of stuff and I just, just stole. What were you, what kind of stuff? I just, just all her, my grandmother's pills. I don't remember the names, but my grandmother took a lot of pain medication. So I know it was in that realm of pain medication and I never drank alcohol, but I remember, um, drinking a bunch of alcohol and taking a bunch of these pills. And I remember it was Passover and I didn't go uh, because I had planned to to kill myself that night. Mm -hmm. And um, what was really interesting is my grandfather, who I had stolen the pills from, he showed up at my door. He said, he said, I... Don't know why I've been directed to come here, and then you know, then you know they take you in an ambulance and they pump your stomach, and then then you end up in a mental hospital, which is like worse because that they don't. That's you know, and you have the mental. It was not fun, I'll tell you. How old were you then? I was, um, I was twenty. Yeah, yeah. So, do you think that looking back on it now, with some perspective, that uh, was it a tried and true suicide attempt or a cry for help? No, it was tried. I mean, it was from I. You know, I was tried and true because I didn't tell anybody, I didn't leave a note, and I took a lot of pills. I mean, I don't know if it would have worked, but there was a lot. So you're still alert when your grandfather. No, I don't. I I only remember a, vaguely a shadow of him saying yeah. that. You know, I I just felt like I had to come here um, mm-hmm. because you didn't show up to the Passover seder, and uh, yeah, that. So I want to get into like how you recover. Uh, huh. from something like that and, <laughs> and the path forward. But but I don't yeah. want to move too far away from this subject of, of food addiction. Yeah. Like I don't want to just brush over sure. that. Um, I think it's a super important topic that deserves a little bit more of a deep dive. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion about it. What does it actually mean? Is it even really yeah. a thing? So describe to me your perspective on food addiction. And it's true because it is not really a thing yet to many people because it's not in the DSM. So a lot of doctors won't acknowledge it, even some of the plant-based doctors. So to me, what food addiction means is refined food addiction. You're not really addicted to food and eating. If you don't eat, you'll die. But there are particular foods for specifically foods like sugar and flour that are very highly refined carbohydrates that certain people are very vulnerable to the effect of so that when we ingest them, 
they have a more drug-like behavior than food-like behavior. And as a recovering alcoholic, I'm sure you understand that there are people out there that can drink alcohol in Mm -hmm. varying amounts and not become an alcoholic. God bless them. Right. But there's certain people like you, one drink, one drunk. And there's people in the world, like my husband, that can eat sugar and flour in almost any amount and be slender and healthy and not have cravings. But there's other people that even a little bit, like maybe if it's the fifth ingredient in a barbecue sauce, will set us off. And it'll set off the phenomenon known as craving, where all we do is want more and mm-hmm. more and more. It sets off that insatiable desire for more. Yeah, it's insidious mm-hmm. for those that suffer from it. And I, I think, you know, I, I started doing a lot of deep thinking about addiction and, and, and what it is specifically and what it's not. And I really think that we need to have a broader conversation and expand the definition of what we mean when we talk about addiction. It's not just drunks and people that can't keep a needle out of their arm. You know, I think on some level, it's this, on some level, I think all of humanity suffers to some extent from some type of compulsive behavior or thought pattern or substance, you know, and food is certainly Mm -hmm. a part of that, but it is a spectrum, right? And so where do you fall on that spectrum? That's why it's so hard, I think, because it's a spectrum, you know, and because some people can have a little, and some people, there are people that identify with the title of food addict, but maybe can have the barbecue sauce as a condiment with the fifth ingredient. And because it exists on a continuum, it's so hard to quantify. Whereas like with high blood pressure, we can say, if your blood pressure is this, you're hypertensive. And there's no real direct test for it. Yeah. And and the substance is, whether it's food or or a drug, is the catalyst. The The, the condition really has to do with your mental, Mm -hmm. emotional, and physiological state. You know, there's a certain person who's going to be sensitive, like you said, to sugar or alcohol or cocaine, um, and it's going to activate them in a way that it isn't for somebody else. But ultimately, the addiction lies within the soul, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you're you're trying to alter your state, Mm -hmm. your state of mind, your physiological state, and you're reaching out often, you know, mostly compulsively, but often even unconsciously Mm -hmm. to medicate yourself in some way because you have some level of discomfort and and sugar hits the spot for a lot of people, but it's about getting at the root of what is activating that. And something that I thought was really cool and interesting about your book is that you get into um, the emotional trauma that you suffered as a young Mm -hmm. person. And, you know, I think that there is a direct nexus between the trauma that we suffer as mm-hmm. young people and how we kind of navigate the world as adults. Um, and I've explored this at length on the podcast. I had Gabor Mate on the show. Yeah, he's he's all about that. I love right? him. And so to hear you speak to that, I think is really powerful. Um, so walk me through kind of what that experience was like as yeah. a young person, because you know you you did have some challenges sure. as a kid. I, I, I thank you for asking that. First, I want to agree with what you say about how addiction often starts because of something like that, that trying to medicate, feel better, especially as a child when you're helpless, you're not, you know, you can't go to a mm-hmm. bar and have a drink or things like that. But I think that often it continues because now it is an addiction. Does that make sense? So like when I was 43 years old and happily married, I was still using, not because of what happened to me when I was five, but because I was really addicted. There was so much energy behind that, yeah. that, that habit at that yeah. point. Right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, my father was psychotic. He was not his fault. He was kicked in the head by a horse when I was little. Like psychotic, like, like clinically psychotic. Like, yes, like wow. he was, and uh, I didn't know him before the accident, but the people that did, like my grandmother said, that that changed him. Now today, he would have been a neurologist, there would have been MRIs, but he, my, my, my dad had a gash in his head from being kicked in the head by a horse, and that changed his behavior. So he was violent, and he was abusive to pretty much everybody in my family. He never physically hit me and my sister, which was interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But in a way, I had survivor's guilt because he hit my brothers and my mom. But the worst was watching him torture my dog. And and that's it's interesting because I think the reason I became vegan so young is because I couldn't protect my dog from my dad. And he would just he would just brutally beat. I love my dogs. I love dogs. I saw mm-hmm. a dog here. I mm-hmm. love dogs so much. And that was my best friend, Snoopy. And um, Snoopy was an epileptic and he would have seizures. And my dad would just beat my dog. And I couldn't do anything about it. And that was the worst thing is, is like, you know, my brothers and my brothers were older. My mom was an adult. Not that it's good to watch humans being beat either, but like when it's a defenseless animal like that, and I hated him so much and like, I wanted to kill him. But like, when you're five, what do you do? You know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have cookies, (laughs) 
do you th- do you think your dad's rage or or anger outbursts are are I mean what was that an expression of I mean was it just a neurological tweak because of the injury that you he know, sustained or? I I didn't know him before I mean okay I don't know if I should even say this because then people think I'm really crazy but I did contact a medium that could talk uh, to him since he's I'm dead all about mediums yeah okay yeah, so <laughs> I, I finally did a, a few years ago and uh, part of it was his personality but the thing is the personality plus the injury just made a bad situation worse mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know and what about your mom my mom was a helpless victim she was you know she had four kids so it's not like she didn't have a job so it's not like she could leave and I don't think there were shelters back then but finally she got the courage to leave they were married gosh a long time I think it was when I was 11 finally when he brutally attacked her she finally, my grandparent, my grandfather, thank God for my grandfather, finally got her to finally leave once mm-hmm. and for all. So yeah, you know, I grew up kind of scared because he was really mean and I was really little and I couldn't really do anything about it back then. And, uh, you know, there was nobody to talk to back then about it. Do you have a specific memory of turning to food to comfort you? Or is it just a blur of like, a, an ev- it just was always there? I'm trying to think if there was an actual incident. It kind of was always there because it was in the environment. You know, we had all the treats there. So that's a good question. I'm going to, I'm going to let it marinate because I, I right now, no. But you grew up with Fruit Loops and Oreos. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny because, um, my mom would pack my lunch. I went to school and one of the things that one of the, again, you know, I think about these things as traumatic memories, but when I went to school there, I sometimes go to this place called Farmer's Market at Third and Fairfax, and they sell these vintage lunch boxes yeah, that yeah. were so I know exa- cool. I know exactly what you're talking about. And, yeah. and all the kids had those, but mine was gray, like the construction workers, the big gray lunch box mm-hmm. with the thermos. And when I think back to the kind of food she fed me, because obviously she was a food addict herself, I mean, I wouldn't just have like one little dessert. Like I would have like the whole double thing of Suzy Q. And then I would have a soda. I would have like just, it, part of it was just that I wasn't being fed the right food either. That I was fed a diet that was going to probably make me fat and sick unless my genetics were such that Mm -hmm. it it wasn't. So part of it was that, let's see, I I just, you know, I remember I have to, I had to crawl on this counter to get to the good stuff in the thing. And I remember the, you know, the box cereals, like Lucky Charms. I remember picking out the charms. I wouldn't eat the Lucky because the Lucky was the, was the oat brand thing. That was terrible. I just Mm -hmm. wanted the marshmallows, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) All right. So you're in, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Mm -hmm. You're the one overweight child in your Mm -hmm. class. And and I remember that too. There was, you know, there was generally one kid who struggled with his weight or her weight. Um, Now it's very different. There's lots of kids. Oh, it's more of them. Maybe most kids at some schools. Um, But that had to be, I would imagine, I don't want to project onto you, but but I would imagine, you know, that's isolating. Yeah. You know, I was lucky that I was funny and I was, I made up, you know, it's the kind of thing where like, I've I've since have done stand-up comedy. I've been on The Tonight Show. One of the things they learn is, is that you make fun of yourself before they make fun of you. Uh And so I was very funny. I was, I was intelligent. I was always the teacher's pet. I was very bright, but I was really funny. And so people still liked me, even though I was fat. I mean, the boys didn't like me. I mean, they liked me because I could do their homework, but they didn't like me like, like, like they would like a normal girl. So I didn't get a lot of teasing. Uh, You know, there was a little bit, but it wasn't like the bullying that goes on today because I really was popular because I was funny and people like funny people, Mm -hmm. you know? It's so hard to imagine you like 200 pounds. Like I can't even, I can't even picture it. In 90, I think it was 94, we had this huge earthquake in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. and I was in Sherman Oaks and I lost everything except for, you know, little, the clothes that I had. And so all the pictures, because the water pipe broke, were gone. Yeah. So I don't have pictures at that weight. But if you go to my YouTube page, Chef AJ, and watch me on The Tonight Show, you'll see me at least at 180. Uh-huh. But I I did have a pair of shorts oh my God. that I used to wear. So these are pretty big. Yeah, those and, look like yeah. 42 or yeah. something so, like that. So I do have that. And then I have also pictures, you know, not quite 200, but, right. you know, most of them have topped out at 165. Right, that right, I have. right. That's wild. So, yeah. all right. So let's pick it back up from, you know, the, after this suicide attempt. Um, I mean, was that a like a, a moment of reckoning where you're like, I got to figure this out? Uh, or, no. You know, what happened after that? No, it was 
dark. I, I just, I, with the, the shame and humiliation, my brother's a psychiatrist. I mean, so it was like, kind of brought a lot of shame to my family. And, uh, you know, I remember, you know, people saying to me, why don't you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps? And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like saying an alcoholic, you know, why don't you just stop drinking? Right. It's yeah. not that easy. If, and so, you know, I was depressed and it was, it was, it was bad. It was bad. And how long did that? You know, I was in a, I was, how long was I in the hospital for? I, you know, they put you. They, they put you in a locked ward of a mental hospital. How long were you there? I want to say like three months. And oh, whoa! And it was. It was. It's crazy. I mean, because some of the people there. I mean, I mean, no disrespect to mentally ill people, are actually crazy. And so it's 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 sort of like in prison. Like they mix like hardened criminals with with less hardened criminals. It, they just put everybody together. And there's something about when that door closes, you know, you can't get out. And I remember my mom visiting me with my dog and it, it just, you know, it's almost like, I didn't know you were going to ask about this or I would have brushed up on my past because it's really something I don't think about, but it was, it was not a good period. <laughs> months. So did they have you on a battery of all kinds of crazy Well, they were, like they, you know what, they, like it, they, they tried medicines. They, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm a real sensitive and allergic person because none of them seemed to work and none of them, either I would throw up or get a rash. So no, mm-hmm. I was. They didn't put me on Thorazine. Thank goodness. And were they just warehousing you, or were you getting help? Like were you know, they counseling I, I mean, you, and- you know, you go to you know, you go to groups. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm not, again, I don't want to sound like I'm belittling them, but like you know, they have like art therapy and music therapy and and psychodrama. So I mean, it, you know, if I wish I had remembered it more, if I knew I was going to be at a point in my life where I'd be able to tell the story, I would have taken notes because it would have made a brilliant, you know, like comedic movie at some point. Well, stuff comedic, but also, you know. And heartbreaking. I mean, that's, yeah, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it I is. mean, and it is that thing, like once you're in, like, you know, a lot of people never make it out. Yeah. Right? No, it's, it was, it's really, really scary. It's, it's, it, I don't wish it on anybody. Maybe they're better now, but, mm-hmm. but you want, you want to hear a funny story. So uh, it, later in life, I became a respiratory therapist. And what does it, that mean? it's a, it's a, it's like, um, like an allied health profession where we go around with like machines and give breathing treatments. It's like in the hospital. And I ended up working at the same hospital where I was locked up as a mental patient, but the mental hospital is across the street. And I never liked going there to give the breathing treatments because I thought, oh, God, what if they lock me up again? Because <laughs> it's not going to make it back yeah, out. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's not like, because most Whoa. people up until now or, you know, nobody knew about this, but I remember going there to give a breathing treatment to a patient. And then I saw a patient that was one of the staff members when I was hospitalized. In other words, the people uh-huh. that were our staff yeah, were still there. Were just as crazy as the people they were trying to help. And again, I apologize if people are offended by crazy. I mean it like in a more loving way. I don't mean crazy, but but the people that that was my psychiatric aide when I was hospitalized was now an incoherent psychiatric patient. The the staff person became a patient. Yes, and I was like, oh my god. I couldn't believe it. It's oh, like, and these are the people that were tending to us. It's 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 scary, you know. Yeah, that's heavy. It's very scary. So so you get out of that, mm-hmm. and then then what happens? Oh my God! So I, I went back. I had to go back to live with my mom. I couldn't go back to the University of Pennsylvania, and you know she basically said you you have to get a job. And I am trying to remember what did I do. It's like my twenty. It's like my twenties were a blur. But mm-hmm. eventually, you know, I did uh, get a job. I actually I got a fun job. Actually, I became a dog walker. Believe it or not, mm-hmm. and I, I remember I, I was the dog walker for Michael J. Fox. And that was oh, really? the funnest job I ever had. He had you get like the plum dog walking I know. It's job. like, it's like literally he was so generous and he, he had two beautiful golden retrievers named Jamie and Rosie that he wanted taken out for like several hours twice a day. And at that time, that was like the only, only client I needed. Like that was the best job mm-hmm. I ever had. In the so you were world. out here. That was yeah. I lived here. I, I moved here in 1971 from Chicago. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, so let's play this forward. When when does it when's the final reckoning moment with weight? Like uh, you know, I know you have sort yeah. of fits and starts. And right, you're, you're taking stabs at trying yeah. to get this under control. Like, right, walk me through that Here. to the breaking point. So, I, like I said, I'm I I didn't have a big history of dieting or trying diets because I saw my mom fail at every diet. I had the stab at anorexia from 14 to 19, which worked but was unsustainable. I got married when I was not, uh, I was going to say 95. But <laughs> <laughs> 35 in 1995 is when I got married. And I, you know, I didn't want to be a fat bride. And as luck would have it, Fenfen had hit the market then. Right. It was very popular. And I wasn't quite really fat enough for it, the doctor said, but because I had a knee injury from all the years of over exercising, he allowed me to have it. And I was able to get my weight down to pretty close to what I am now. Well, powerful uh, stuff. Yeah, it anorexia and a pill. Basically. Oh my god! Yeah. So exactly, they both work. But again, they're both dangerous. 
they're both life-threatening and neither, neither of them are sustainable. So I was so happy when I was on FenFen because it allowed me to keep eating the crap that I was eating, but it tricked my brain into thinking I was full so I could eat just smaller amounts right. of crap. Which and were is, you all jacked up too? No, it actually it had an antidepressant effect really? on me. So it actually made me feel really good. I, I felt fantastic on it. Things rolled off my back like water off a duck's back. How I, long were you on it? I was on it for probably six months. Oh, that's that's pretty long. Yeah. I would have, don't you get a tolerance yeah. though where you yeah. still have to take more and Well, more yeah, you do, but here's what happened. It got removed. The yeah. FDA took it away. So, and I remember, th- this shows like- And it was th- two drugs, right? Yeah, there was, it was one that's the dangerous- Fentramine and, and fenfluramine yeah. that, right. that separately worked okay, but together were like this magic bullet that was going to anni- annihilate mm-hmm. the obesity epidemic. So what happened is people were getting heart lung damage like it, from it. And so I remember going to the mailbox one day and there was a letter from the FDA and I'm like, why is the FDA writing me, you know? Well, they had removed it from the market. We were told to stop taking it and to go immediately to a cardiologist to have an echocardiogram. So I was fine, but I really still wanted the drug. So I went online and I tried to buy it in other countries, mm-hmm. but I couldn't buy the potent combination. I could only buy, I believe, the fentramine illegally. Right, there was no and Silk Road then. Didn't work. <laughs> so guess you what? Yeah. Within three months, the weight came right back on. Mm-hmm. I learned nothing. Right. And so I just assumed that I was destined to be fat, 160, 165. I just figured that's my set point. Mom was fat. My grandma was fat. My great grandma, that's it. So I'll right. just learn to accept In it. your makeup, genetically yeah. predetermined. I figured that's it, you know, and I remember because as a vegan, you know, I had started to teach cooking and I remember thinking, you know, like it was a little bit embarrassing because you think of people in the vegan world that are like uh, influencers, like, you know, you think of like Mary McDougal, she's very trim and, you know, Ann Esselstyn. And I just figured, you know, it's not in my cards. It's, and so I was going to do the best I could, but what was happening I started teaching. I remember teaching at Whole Foods, Pasadena, when they opened that big store. And I was very popular as a culinary teacher. I had the biggest class, 77 people. And I was doing a culinary class. And I remember this gentleman raises his hand. You know, I'm thinking he's going to ask about the garlic or the onion. He said, I go, yeah. He goes, if the vegan diet's so good, why are you so fat? And I felt like saying, I don't know, why are you such an asshole? But yeah, I didn't called say, you out. yeah. And then people were, and once I started putting these little videos on YouTube, people were saying the same thing. It was generally men saying that. And my husband would delete the comments. And it didn't, it didn't really hurt my feelings so much because they were right. Because I really didn't know why I was so fat. I really, mm-hmm. like, but then I found out. And I went to a place called True North. Mm-hmm. In January of 2011. What what motivated you to go there, though, first well, of all? That's, this is it. This is interesting. It wasn't because I was fat. I um, if, In my fo- first book on process, I talk about my uh, string of, of fetal deaths. Uh, the, the, the babies weren't quite yet born, but I had four miscarriages, right, one after the other. Oh, wow, yeah, 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 and the first one was like almost a live birth. And so that set me into a pretty bad depression. This was in two, in the year 2000, February 1st, 2000 was when the first baby died, the one that was oh. almost born. And I was 40 years old, and so it was tough. It, it had four of these in a row. And at the same time, my mom and my dad and my dog died. So it was like, phew, phew, phew. Yeah, so I was, I was like, I developed something called panic disorder. And I couldn't leave my house for a year. I lost my job in my house because I kept having panic attacks. And I wouldn't go on meds because I don't like meds. I don't like the, it's not, I just didn't like the idea of meds, especially psych meds. Well, well, you had, I would imagine you associate that with being in that institution. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like that's a highway back there. Yeah, I right? don't yeah. want to be on psych mm-hmm. meds, you know, and especially because, you know, I'm vegan and I keep thinking, well, I'm vegan. I should, you know, a diet should be enough. I should be able to, you know, do this. Right. The problem is I had already had that major depressive episode, you know, in childhood, which again, sets you up for another one. So I was depressed, but now it wasn't just depression. I was having panic attacks and I, it, it, they're scary because, you know, I'd be walking my, I had two dogs at the time and I'd be walking them, I'd get a panic attack and then I'd lose control of my arms and then Whoa. the dogs would go. And so it got so scary, especially when I was driving that I just checked out and I just stayed home for nine months. Like well, shut in like an agoraphobe. Right. Agoraphobia. And so the problem was if you don't go to work for nine months, <laughs> you know, they, you don't make any money. And so, so what happened was is, uh, this is actually outlined on a show called The Dog Whisperer with Caesar Milan, is I found out that my dog, uh, Sparky, at the time, was able to predict if I was going to have a panic attack. He just knew, just kind of like my grandfather right. knew. Like they know about earthquakes. Right, too. like he could sense it. And so if it was coming on, he could, he just like, he would stare at me, he would paw at me, he would lick me, he would bark. And I didn't train him to do this. And so I- 
I, I, the problem is he was a little bit dog aggressive. And I found out there was a thing called a psychiatric service dog, a service dog. And what happened was, is I, uh, he, I went on the dog whisperer and, and he became my service dog. And I was able to reenter the workforce using the service dog, go back to work. And I did start taking medication at the- Hold on a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went on, I went on the dog whisperer. <laughs> like how you, what? Okay. You know? <laughs> well, so, so what happened yeah. was is, okay, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh-huh. A lot of this is- I in, just called up. Cesar. And I like, wish yeah. I could do that. So, so, so what happened was, is I, I saw an ad in the LA Times. We had a paper, we had newspapers back mm-hmm. then, the Sunday Times. I believe this would have been 2006 now or 2005. And I, I the show had only been on one season. He wasn't as huge of a star then as he is now because this was season yeah. uh, casting for season two. And I found out because my psychiatrist was willing to write me a letter because uh, to have this dog because if I felt safe with him because I knew that if he if he could predict that I was going to have a panic attack if I felt one coming on and I was driving I could pull over I could get to a safe space and so Caesar Milan helped me uh, get him certified so that he would be suitable in public. And it was, mm-hmm. it was great. It was a wonderful, heartwarming episode. The thing is, I did go on a small amount of medication at the urging of, believe it or not, a naturopathic doctor who said, I can't help you. You need these drugs. So I went on an antidepressant called Lexapro in 2011. 10 milligrams, not that much. And it 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 did stop me from having panic attacks. It did work. The thing was, is it does, it also has other effects and it just, you don't have as joyous or a vibrant as life Mm -hmm. when you're on these medications. You're just kind of like, yeah, you you know, so in a way it was good because here having panic attacks, you know, I remember one time the scariest panic attack was um, I was taking a bath and we had at that time a sunken tub and I got a panic attack in the bathtub. And when I was getting panic attacks, my arms and legs would go numb. And I couldn't get out of the tub. And then you just end up being naked and so freezing. Crazy. It was really scary. So so I went on this medicine. But again, I wasn't really having, it, it, like you say, it was more of a flat affect. I wasn't really having a joyous life. And plus, I didn't like the idea of being on medication, you know? And I tried to get off them by titrating the dose. I went to these specialists. I flew around the world. And I, I could lower it to 7.5, to 5, to 2.5. But the minute I went lower than 2.5, the panic, panic attacks attack. were coming back. And I went back on So in about 2010, I heard about a book called The Pleasure Trap by Dr. Lyle and Dr. Mm -hmm. Goldhammer, my two mentors and now friends. And I read the book. It was a great book, by the way, about addiction and and, and more. And I found out that Dr. Goldhammer had this center in Santa Rosa, California, and that if you fill out the form online, you can have a free consult. So I did that. And I said, listen, I'm on this psychiatric medicine. I'd really prefer not to be on it. Uh, can you help me? I was I was fat, but it, that's not it why. It wasn't about weight loss. Not yet, you. but mm-hmm. it's interesting because that opened the door because then I met the secret weapon, him and Dr. Lyle. And he said, yeah, you're going to come to the center. I'm going to put you on disability. We're going to fast you for six weeks and we'll get you off the meds. Well, I get to True North, Martin Luther King Jr. birthday weekend of 2011. I go with a friend of mine, Tim, you know, for support and my service dog, Sparky. And the first thing you do before you water fast is see one of the actual medical doctors. He said, you can't fast on psych meds. I couldn't fast. They did a juice fast, you know. But the thing is, is what happened is I met Dr. Doug Lyle, who is the best. You should interview him. He is so- No, I'd love to have him on. I've heard him speak many times. He's, he's and, a good you know, friend. I love the book. And the book has come up, up many times the, on the show. The, the, and, and you know, the book is going to be on audio now. Mm-hmm. And guess who got to record it? I don't know, you? Yes, All I right, was chosen. Awesome. As the, I know, that's like the big, that's like the biggest feather in my mm. cap that I was- because It's a full circle moment for yeah, you. Well, it is because it was like neither of them wanted to do it, but the publisher needed the book out. And because I- I relatively understood the material. They let me do it. So it was really that's very cool. nice. Thank so you. this is 2011. Yeah. January of 2011. I, 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 that's not that long ago. No, it was, I, I thought like this went way back for you, much further back. Well, the trauma and drama goes further yeah. back, but this no, particular- No, I know. But, yeah. yeah, but the, this I've sort only, of turning point for no, you I, I, was much I'm, more recent than I recall. I'm the nouveau thin. I've only yeah. been thin for about six years now. So right. yeah. Um, so I met Dr. Lyle, who's who's fabulous, and I love his book and his lectures. And I actually had a you know a, an individual appointment with him then. And again, we still hadn't talked about weight loss then. It was just about can you help me with my panic disorder? And he helped me more in that one session than all the doctors did my whole so life. So you went up there for the session or was that on the phone? Up there because he, there, he works right? there. He mm-hmm. works there and he works at the McDougal program, both in Santa Rosa. And he gave me some really good techniques, explained what panic disorder was, and he really helped me. So- I still could not yet get off medication. I tried. 
And then it was now September of that year. And what happened, and this is interesting, because I really believe that sometimes when things in life, and you, you might believe this too, there's no real accidents, is sometimes when things are difficult and painful in the moment, you look back and you go, wow, that was really a blessing. Mm-hmm. So we're now talking- Story of my life. Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So September of 2011, like I was really embarrassed that I was on psych meds and I didn't want anybody to know. I felt that as a personal failure, like that what's wrong with me that I have to take these drugs and what's wrong with me that I can't get off of them mm-hmm. because they tell you they're not addictive, but they are because you can't yeah. get off of them. So in September of 2011, I got a job as Chef AJ, like doing a really cool presentation at a high-end kind of thing. And I got there and I was going to be there for almost a week in New York and I forgot my meds. And um, my doctor, of course, would have written a prescription for me and I could have got them. But the people that I was staying with said, oh, no problem. So-and-so, their neighbor, was a pharmacist. Just tell me what you need and we'll get it for you. And I was too embarrassed. Mm. As it turns out, I'm on thi- I was on thyroid meds too. So I just said, well, this. Well, after not taking them for a week, you go through, oh, it's it's tough. That's not the way to get off psych meds, by mm-hmm. the way. It's sort of like if you ever you weren't a very you were titrated down to a pretty low no, dose I, too. No, I, I was back up oh, to ten. Up. I was back okay. up to ten. If you ever saw those dolls, they're like gray and you they're rubber and you squeeze them and their eyes pop out and their ears pop out. <laughs> yeah. When you go off psych meds like that, you actually, it's almost like you feel your brain wiring and it's not a pleasant thing. And like, you have to kind of lay there in the dark and you, you, it was a a horrible, horrible experience, but I was so embarrassed. I went through this and Doug Lyle, Dr. Lyle really helped me through it. He called my husband. I was, it was not pretty going through this detox, Mm. but after I got through it, just like anything else, you know, that withdrawal sucks. So (laughs) you, but you were staying with people at the time? I was staying with people. And you didn't tell them that this was going on? I was too embarrassed. What is wrong? What's I was too, I was too embarrassed. I was, I was still able <laughs> to able do, to my do job. your event. Or I whatever. was, I was yeah. able to do my job and I was uh-huh. able to do it well, but the rest of the time I just kind of laid there like in, in a fetal position, just feeling my brain just mm-hmm. go crazy. But I got through it and it's just the same thing, whether it's drugs or alcohol or food, food withdrawal is a bitch, but addiction I think is worse actually. But when you get through it, you know what it's like. I mean, have you ever met anybody in recovery from Anything that ever said, you know, it was much better back then. No. So so I was off it and it was great. And by now I had some techniques, some actual cognitive behavioral techniques that I learned from Dr. Lyle about what to do when I had a panic attack. Like what? Okay. For example, all the other doctors said, oh, you need to meditate. You need to breathe. Well, when you're in the throes of a panic attack, you can't all of a sudden ask your body to relax. So Dr. Lyle would say, no, what you do is you run in place. You do jumping decks. You, the, the panic disorder is like, there's a lion. You need to run. I was what they, there's fight, flight, or freeze. I was a freezer. And Dr. Lyle taught me, no, you have to run. I go, but what happens when I'm having, you know, I'm in the car? He goes, you just squeeze your arms like this with the steering wheel. So I was able to use the techniques he taught me. And what happened is, do I still get panic attacks? Occasionally. But the stakes have to be high now. Like like um, there was a pit bull in the neighborhood coming towards me. I got a panic attack. But mm-hmm. a regular person might have too, right? Mm-hmm. I was in a car accident a couple of years ago. I got a panic attack, but I'm not having yeah, them they're every commensurate day. with a with the threat. Yeah. R- exactly. But whereas before, nothing would happen. And so, so yeah, so so that's what happened. So I was using Dr. Lyle really for panic disorder and psychiatric medication withdrawal. He told me to read a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic, which is, explains that these medicines not only don't work most of the time, but actually are harmful. And that in trials, clinical trials, placebo was more effective. And so if I had read that, book, I would not have chosen to go on meds. But I was starting to work as Chef AJ in the Vegan World Conference here and there. Dr. McDougall had had me a couple of times. And in uh, the, the weekend after Thanksgiving 2011, Dr. Lyle and I, we'd become friendly. We were on a job together. And at a break, I said to him, I said, Doug, I get to call him Doug. <laughs> I said, I know that you hear this all the time. Because now by then, I was eating a really health-promoting diet, by the way. I need to backtrack a little bit. From August 1st, 2008, when I first heard Dr. Esselstyn speak, I stopped eating sugar, oil, and salt. I was eating a health-promoting diet, and I wasn't eating the mass copious amounts of candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice creams. I was able to make rich date nut treats, but I wasn't eating sugar, oil, salt. But I was still 50 pounds heavier, and I couldn't figure out why. Well, I know now why, and it's in the book. But I said to him, I said, Doug, I said, I swear to you, I'm not cheating. I'm eating a whole food diet. I don't eat sugar, oil, salt. Why am I so fat? And he basically sat me down and explained calorie density to me, mm-hmm. which is- Yeah, and this has become your thing. I mean, I've yeah. seen you give your your keynote presentation many times and it's super powerful, but it's also like, 
oh yeah, duh. Yeah. You know, like it, it's so elementary in yeah. many ways, but I think the concepts elude most people. So, mm-hmm. so you know, walk us through that yeah. because I think it's really important information right. for people to know. And it also, sorry to no, jump no, on no, you like please. that, but I think, you know, it helps um, with this confusion that you've lived through between what it means to eat a vegan diet and what it means to eat a whole food plant-based diet and what it means to eat like, you know, the ultimate sort of health promoting, longevity promoting, disease reversing type of diet, because those are very different things. And I've been through them all, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes, thank you. That's a great question. So I was eating a whole food plant-based diet without sugar, oil, salt. I wasn't cheating, but not having understood caloric density, I was eating way too much of the whole plant foods that were calorically dense, such as the nuts, the seeds, the avocados, and the dried fruit. And there's nothing wrong with those fruits. An athlete such as yourself, you need those calories. But somebody that's a female, and as Dr. Goldhammer says, females are energy conserving, estrogen producing fat storage machines. And somebody that was already fat didn't need so many calories from those calorically dense foods, even though they they, they have nutrients and they have fiber. And when Dr. Lyle explained to me what Dr. McDougall had been saying for 40 years, but for some reason it eluded me until it was like face to face. And he explained it to me, the concept, at least for me, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And yes, there are people that can eat more fat and not be fat, but if you're fat, it might not be you. When I when I ate a more McDougall type diet, you know, and, and didn't add any fats, like the weight just came off. It was like so weird because I wasn't even eating that many nuts. I was weighing and measuring an ounce a day thinking I needed them or I would die without them. And I remember it was so funny because for the, uh, Dr. Lyle, he's funny. He tricks you into doing things. He has you do these experiments. And so he said to me, he goes, you know, just for a month, I want you to not eat any added fat, no nuts, you know, just for a month, I want you to do it. Uh, and, 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 and I go, that's, can I say bullshit or? Yeah, no. say whatever, oh, okay. I didn't, say whatever you want. I said, that's bullshit, Doug. I said, that's not going to work. You know, nuts are healthy. You got to have them. All the doctors are saying you got to have at least this much. He said, just do it for a month. I said, you know what? You're so stupid. <laughs> I don't know if I said stupid. I said, I said you're wrong. I'm going to do this for three months. I'm not going to start until January 2nd, 2012, because that's when I get back from True North. I work there every Christmas as a guest chef. And I'm going to do it for three months because I'm going to do it till my birthday and show you that I'm not going to lose any weight. And then on my birthday, I'm going to have a rich date nut dessert and go, meh. Well, guess what? Dr. Lyle's always right. And he was right. And I was losing a pound a week doing that. I couldn't Mm -hmm. believe how easy it was because now I was eating more food, but calorically dilute food. And in my opinion, better food because I was eating like lots of potatoes and sweet potatoes and rice and beans. So I was filling up. I was less hungry and eating bigger volumes of food that had less calories. And it's like, like you said, it's so, it's so obvious, but it it does elude people. Right. So you mentioned uh, the McDougal type diet. So for somebody who's listening, who doesn't know who who John McDougal is and and kind of what he stands for, maybe it's worth flushing that out a little bit. Yeah. Well, I'll sing a little ditty because last time I was on, I sang the Goldhammer song. So. Oh, you did? I don't remember. Oh, I did. I remember that. You let me sing the Goldhammer (laughs) song. You can sing it again. John McDougal has a plan based on carbohydrates. If you eat them, you'll be trim and not have ass or thigh weight. John McDougal, he's the man. He's as smart as Plato. Eating starch will make you thin. Just eat a damn potato. Oh so, <laughs> my God. Did you write that? Well, yeah. I, mean, I, did? okay. I, I didn't write the melody, yeah, obviously. Right. It's Yankee Doodle. But So so here's where things get, get sticky for a lot of people. You know, and this comes up all the time in the podcast. Like right now, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, talk and energy uh, behind this um, idea that carbohydrates are terrible. You should be eating a low carb, mm. no carb, potentially even ketosis, high fat type diet, which is in total, you know, juxtaposition, contra, contraposition to where John McDougal yeah, is coming from, yeah. who, you know, who's basically his basic principle is we're starch of wars and yeah. we should be eating these complex carbohydrates in natural food form. Yeah, I, I agree with him. You know, I, I run a program in LA and actually online too called the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And I have people now that have lost 100 to 300 pounds and kept it off for like five years eating nothing but carbohydrates. So to me, and a, a diet not high in carbohydrates would be 
not fun. It would it would be sad. It would be deprivation. And you know, potatoes make you thin. I mean, didn't you interview or did I had Andrew? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Taylor, yeah. Andrew so Taylor so how the how the heck did he lose 120 pounds just eating potatoes? I I mean, they really are the perfect food for health and weight loss. You know, according to something called the Satiety Index, they they are the most satisfying food in the world. Potatoes because they're filling. They're so but filling. They're also nutrient dense. Absolutely, they have, they have a lot more nutrients in them than people realize. They, we sort of think of them as a junk food, like no. oh, it's a white food, like it's just calories without any vitamins and minerals, but it's actually right. has a lot of good stuff in it. Um, but to be clear, you know, we need to kind of define our terms. I mean, yeah. when you say carbohydrate, that Complex. doesn't mean, yeah, that doesn't mean, you know- well, Flour, sugar, uh, alcohol. Yeah, like wheat, pasta, I don't, and I, exactly. Coca-Cola. <laughs> I mean, whole, yeah. unrefined complex carbohydrates, mm-hmm. whole grains in their whole form, not processed into a flour, legumes, beans, split peas, lentils in their whole form cooked with water, and potatoes, sweet potatoes, and winter squashes. These are the foods that our ancestors ate throughout most of human history that are still eaten parts of the world today that are free of the diseases like obesity and heart disease that plague us. I mean, the Okinawans, according to the Blue Zones, are the longest lived people in the world. Don't they eat something like over 70% of their calories from sweet potatoes? Mm -hmm. So these are foods that make you thin. The problem is, is people are adding things like oil to them for French fries and and chips. And that's the problem. It's not the carbohydrate, it's the fat, the cheese, the butter, the oil that people add to it that make them fat and sick. Right. So let's get back to this idea of caloric density. Mm-hmm. You know, when you give your talk, you always have these- The amazing, jars, yeah, I almost have, brought them. Well, the jars and yeah. you also have these charts where you show what a stomach looks like. Right. Like here's a stomach with, you know, tons of vegetables yep. and it's completely full you know, more vegetables than you could possibly sit down and eat until you're completely stuffed. Um, and then the caloric equivalent of that is, you know, I don't know, like, you know, uh, an ounce of oil in your stomach. Yeah. It's just like a right. little, like it just looks like a tiny Be little like bit of your stomach. Maybe two and a half tablespoons. Yeah. Right. It's so like, you, it doesn't even show up. It puts it into perspective right. in terms of calories. So yeah. on the one hand, you have these foods that are super high in fiber, minerals, vitamins, phytonutrients, micronutrients, all those things that you need and want and that we're always trying to get. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have, well, it's, there's a little, what's wrong with a little bit of olive oil, right? But you, when you see that, you realize like, oh, wow, it's so, you know, a food like olive oil is so calorically dense and so nutrient poor um, that it seems harmless. But when you kind of look at it through that lens, you can kind of, you have this sort of awakening moment where you're like, oh, now I get it. Well, also it has no fiber. That's the most important thing probably. You know, Dr. Goldhammer always says that foods like sugar, oil, and salt, they're not really food. They're not found in nature in any concentrated form. And they fool our brain's satiety mechanisms and cause us to overeat exponentially. The thing is, is you don't sense any fullness from olive oil. So if I were to make you a meal of like, a gluten-free pasta, brown rice pasta with steamed vegetables and an oil-free marinara. You could have a very nice big serving of food for about 500 calories. If you eat that same meal at a restaurant where there'll be about 500 calories from oil, from the sauce, from the pasta, from the vegetables, you don't experience any more fullness. They've done studies that show that the extra calories from oil are insidious. They slip under the radar undetected by the mechanisms of stretch, uh, nutrient, and calorie receptors. And so, you know, I remember when I stopped using oil in 2008, I didn't tell my husband because he didn't need to know. I make his breakfast, lunch, send his lunch to work, I make his dinner. So I stopped using it, not because of caloric density, because Dr. Esselstyn said it creates heart disease, diabetes, and obesity everybody in my family was dying or dead from heart disease. I figured, well, why would I do this? And you don't miss it because you can make food delicious without it. Well, you can use the, the nuts and seeds if you want. So about seven months after stopping oil, my husband had to go to a formal event and he's thin, six feet, 160 pounds. And he doesn't normally wear a belt, but seven months after stopping oil, we had to go to this event and he went to put his belt on and now he can't attach it. There's no more holes. He goes, oh, I must have cancer. I'm losing all this weight. And he got on the scale. He had lost like eight pounds. Without trying. Without without trying. Without even knowing. So he was being experimented on against his will. So if somebody that doesn't want to lose weight, that doesn't need to lose weight, will lose weight that effortlessly just by stopping oil, imagine what could happen if people actually did it on purpose. To be fair, there is a little bit of an adjustment. If you're used to eating foods with tons of oil Mm -hmm. and, you know, and like lots of sugar or, you know, salt and, Mm -hmm. and the like, like- you you do I don't know if I would call it a detox, but you you oh, have yeah. to like go through a period where you adjust just like you would when you're switching from milk to almond milk you're or something like that. Right. Like what I found though, and I'm not completely oil free. But like, you're, you know, you're athletic. I you're not. You're not 
But like when I'm not working out a lot, like if I'm not careful, I'll put on weight and then I have to go and then I have to be more conscious and, right. and consciously aware of those kinds of things than I than I am when I'm out there crushing it all the time. So, you know, I'm very intimately familiar with this and I've seen how it works in my own life. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's important to just acknowledge like, OK, yeah, it's going to taste a little bit. Di- is, right. It's going to be a little bit different. But like, honestly, if you just go two weeks or, you know, yeah. eat, I don't know, a week, whatever, everybody's probably a little bit different. When you complete that cycle, you know, it's not really a detox, but it's an adjustment. Yep. Then you land in a place where like, oh, I don't, I don't know the difference. I can't tell. You I don't, can't. I don't miss it anymore. But you have, you have to go through that period. Right. And most people just, they, they just don't want to do it. Well, they don't. They don't want to do they, it. You're so right. Most people will not go through the pain of detoxification. It's not even withdrawal. that painful. It's like, okay, it tastes a little bit different. Maybe it doesn't taste quite as amazing as I'm used to, but like, you know, is it really that big of a deal? You're talking about a concept that Dr. Goldhammer in his book, The Pleasure Trap calls neurological adaptation, neuroadaptation. And it's this, and, and, and that will, happen. The other thing people don't understand is the role of a neurotransmitter called dopamine in this equation. Dopamine is a trans- neurotransmitter that's released when we have a pleasurable experience, such as eating or having sex. And all eating stimulates the production of dopamine in our brain. Even kale, steamed kale at 100 calories a pound, stimulate the production of dopamine. But the more calorically concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released. Well, oil is the most calorically concentrated food on the planet. It's 4,000 calories per pound, 40 times as calorically dense as kale. And since most people aren't doing much in life to feel good, like you and me, like exercising regularly or doing volunteer work, they're relying on these high-fat, high-calorie foods to medicate to feel good. So if you take away the most calorically dense food, they're going to feel bad mm-hmm. because they're not having their drug. Maybe that's why uh, when you challenge the high fat uh, camp, mm. they get so testy. Yeah. I wanted to show you, I didn't bring my <laughs> you're, jars. You're, you're basically, you're, you're threatening to take away that dopamine Absolutely. Charge. Absolutely. You know, I get people that come to me and they go, oh, I'm, I'm Greek. I'm Italian. I, you know, I, olive oil's in my blood. And so I'll pour them a cup and I'll go here, drink it. They won't. You'll vomit if you drink it. It's because people are looking to food to medicate, to celebrate. And they're not, like you say, they're not dealing with what's really going on. And that's really what it is. is It's because I I would challenge you that I could make the food taste delicious without oil because I was a restaurant chef that didn't use oil. I Mm -hmm. think some of my recipes are that good. But what they're missing is the high hit of dopamine. Mm-hmm. I oh sorry no what do you got there well it's just funny because so I didn't bring my jars but yeah I brought you I brought like all that. these snacks so so again I recently spoke at a veg fest and I had to take two planes on Southwest because there wasn't a direct flight so on the first leg of the flight they gave me this and on the second leg they gave me this right so you now, got Ritz crackers you yeah. got cookies and peanuts. Got peanuts now this food that i can fit in the palm of my both basically in the palm of my hands this is over a thousand calories mm-hmm. what i eat for lunch which is usually like 2 pounds of potatoes or sweet potatoes baked into fries or roasted and a pound of broccoli has less calories than this right it's like this huge plate of food and this is and people think nothing of eating this on their flight. It's just a little snack. Yeah, and it's probably 30, I don't know, a lot, it's a lot of fat. This is yeah. nothing. Yeah, it's crazy. And you it's could crazy, have right? so many fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and rice and beans for the same amount in processed food. Right. I, you know, people say to me all the time, like, like aren't you just starving all the time? But oh my I, eat, God. I eat massive amounts of food, you know, like- Gigantic, you know. I'll eat like five potatoes, yeah. and I'll eat, you know, just unbelievable Isn't it amounts fun? of beans, and like I'm, I'm full all the time. I know. You know, it's so fun. And people, if they until they really understand caloric density and actually implement it, they don't realize that as slender people, we can eat so much more food. We can take in twice as much food, but yet still consume half as many calories. And again, mm-hmm. Dr. Rolls is the one that discovered this at Penn State. She wrote a series of books on it. I, I didn't, I didn't discover calorie. I mean, I discovered it. I didn't invent it. I think I just honed it for people that especially want to be plant-based. Right, to help them to understand. What, right. I, what I like about your story is, is that there's this evolution. Like you're, you're like a chef in the, in the plant-based world, in the vegan world. Like you're, you're doing cooking demonstrations mm-hmm. at True North yeah. before you're actually fully understanding kind of what you talk about right. now. Like, so this didn't happen overnight. No. You were immersed in this subculture and yet still you weren't 
fully clicking with what needed to be done to get your own health under yeah. control. I think Dr. Goldhammer, again, him and Dr. Lyle, it's almost like a conspiracy, a friendly one. He tricked me because, you know, when I arrived at True North, um, you know, 50 pounds heavier, he didn't say, you know, you're fat. Don't be, you know, don't be doing cooking demos. But he said something like, and I can't remember exactly, but he said something like, you know, you're already very talented. You're a very talented chef. He goes, and we judge a chef's talent by how they can concentrate things like sugar, fat, and salt. And he goes, you know, but if you got skinny, you would rule the world. He goes, you're already a bitch, but if you were a skinny bitch. And so he did sort of like like the whitewashing of the fence with uh, Tom Sawyer, you know, remember like mm-hmm. where they made it seem like a chore was fun. And he made it seem like it was going to be so great to be thinner for, for, for just in general and, and that he could actually help me do it. Like he really gave me hope, like that he could actually explain to me how to do it. And, and empowering he, you rather than shaming you. Exactly. And, 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 and I started those two guys, they're like my brothers, man. I mean, like if I hadn't met them, I don't know where my life would be today. How long were you at True North? I was only there eight days the first time, but I've since been back every year, several times a year, not as a patient, but as a, a visiting chef. Right. All right. So a couple questions about this. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, for people that are listening, True, True North is the same facility that you saw in What the Health, if you watched that movie. I'm getting ready for another what? song. Sorry. You know, are you going to sing a song again? <laughs> no, uh, I don't, hold I don't on know. a second. I'm I'll let you kidding. sing a song I'm in a minute. I'm teasing. Um, and if you saw that movie, you recall there's a couple case studies uh, in the documentary where there's people that are on all kinds of crazy meds and they're overweight. There was that person who could barely walk. Mm-hmm. And then you see kind of what happens after however long their tenure was there where they seem to be doing much better. But that's the same place. And it's also the home of Michael Clapper, right? Is he, he still there? He recently left. Oh, he, he was did. there for seven years mm. and now he's he has, he just retired from oh, True did. North uh-huh. in December. But there's other wonderful- He's a wonderful, he's a wonderful oh, man. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They have Dr. Lim now, who is the medical director of the McDougal program there. They have Dr. Peter Sultana. They have Dr. Solera. So they have other wonderful medical right. doctors and naturopaths. All right. What, one thing I'm interested in- in what goes on there has to do with the fasting aspect yeah. of it. I mean, we're seeing emerging science uh, that is speaking to the health benefits of intermittent fasting mm-hmm. and and what can be achieved. But there's also, you know, look, this can go wrong. Also, there's people that that don't do this properly and they get sick or you know potentially suffer some nasty consequences. So, what is the what is the relationship of the fasting aspect to the rest of what goes on? Right. So it is a medically supervised therapeutic water only fasting center. It's been there for over 32 years, founded by Dr. Alan Goldhammer and his wife, Dr. Jennifer Morano. Mm-hmm. However, not everybody that goes there fasts. There are people like me that medically cannot fast. There are people there that don't want to fast, maybe because it's too scary or too hard. So they have two other levels of care. One is that you can do a juice fast, which I think could be safe for people sometimes to do at home. I would never recommend people do a water fast without medical supervision because they check on you all the time. They're checking your blood pressure. They're checking your temperature. Mm -hmm. They're checking your blood and your urine. So I personally would not recommend people water fasting at home. And they fast people up to 40 days, believe it or not. That's wild. Even slender people for certain medical conditions. Water only? Water only. Many people in the plant-based movement, like Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Campbell, have actually gone there and fasted. I remember Dr. Campbell had that Agent Orange or something, and True North actually Mm. helped his recovery. So, So we get- you get, get a lot of famous people there, not just in plant-based, but mm-hmm. like in the real celebrity world too, because they help people with certain conditions like type 2 diabetes, autoimmune disease, heart disease, almost every condition get better and get better faster. And doing this by the complete abstinence of food, except for pure distilled water and complete rest. And so that that's their highest level of care. And that's why most people seek them out. But then again, not everybody can or will fast. But even if you do fast, you can't you have to eat at some point. You have mm-hmm. to go home eating. So if you fast, you have to have at least half that much time to refeed. You can also go there as an unrestricted feeder, which is the funnest. And that's what I go, which means all you do is eat the food. Three times a day, mm-hmm. buffets set up in caloric density, all you can eat, delicious food by Chef Bravo and Chef Mauricio. And people still get well. People still get well just eating this SOS-free, low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet. And they have lectures twice a day, 
10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And when I'm there during Christmas, three times a day, sometimes I'll have a- You go every year? I've been going every year for eight years. <laughs> and it's and I'm like- the, I'm like, What do you still get out of it? Just, oh, com, just, um, community. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, b- having the childhood that I had, holidays are very painful for me. Most of my family is dead. And so it's like, it's a place to go. So I've been going mm-hmm. there every year for Christmas, anywhere from 10 days to five weeks. Um, and, and we do the holidays there. And we have camaraderie and game. I'm like the social director. So we have the best time. And it's, uh, some people do fast at the holidays, but most of the people don't. And we have special demos and and Iron Chef competitions. I get out of going just, it's like going home. It's like, it's the home I ever had. And it's, it's, it's a, a, a privilege and an honor to be able to do that. So, so uh, a lot of people just do unrestricted feeder. You know, it's so funny because I remember, um, even though it's been years since I've been on your podcast, People found out about True North because I sang that song, and people were at True North from hearing me on your podcast. Oh, really? Oh, so crazy. the ripple effect is incredible there. So uh, you you have these levels of care, and it, you know what's interesting is I, Dr. Golden will probably get mad at me for saying this because he's always full. But I had to attend a wedding in the Napa Valley, and Dr. Goldhammer charges less a day than any hotel. So I just stayed there for three days with my husband <laughs> and and used it as a hotel yeah. and got all my meals. Uh-huh. And it's pet friendly uh, it, under certain. Yeah circumstances. Um, That's yeah. So, so people, and Dr. Pam Popper says she does the same thing because where else are you going to get food like that? And people, you get mm-hmm. the education, you get the camaraderie. It's about a half a mile away from where Dr. McDougall runs his program. His program doesn't run all year round like True North. It's, it's, it's an incredible experience. And if, if I could have one wish for anyone that was struggling with any kind of lifestyle disease or, or weight issue, if they could just experience the level of healing that goes on there, mm-hmm. it, it would make all the difference in the world to them. Mm-hmm. But for somebody who who can't find their way there, I mean, you've mm-hmm. worked with, I don't know, 2,000 people yeah. at this point, yes. helping them right. um, learn how to lose weight and, and, and keep it off. And I kind of want to get into, you know, some of the strategies that you've employed, like what works, what doesn't. And you explain all of this in the book, the <laughs> secret, what is it? The, the secrets, secrets to, to ultimate, ultimate weight, weight loss. loss. I don't have you the know, book, like, but I have you know, the this cover. Like print out. Yeah, it's not yeah, done. It's I've got not the cover. Out, but, but it's going to be out. By the time ve- this goes yeah, up, it will it be out. It should be out. There's nothing um, inside. No, we're, we're not doing a book. We're just doing a cover. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a huge, you know, test group of people that you've worked with. Right. So before we dig into the specifics, because I want to talk about travel and expense and time and all that kind of stuff, but what have you learned that might be non-obvious to somebody listening about like what doesn't work and what works that, that like you just wish people really got? I wish people would know if they're struggling. And I think you probably know this is that if you're an addict of any kind, moderation never works. Mm-hmm. And they knew this. What does that in, even mean? Moderation. Yeah, exactly. I think it was in the 17th century, the 18th century, there was a saint named St. Augustine who said that complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. Mm-hmm. And if people could understand that it, moderation for ex- really rarely works for anyone, but it's never worked for an addict. And it that is the hardest concept, Rich, for people to grasp is the concept of abstinence because people don't like that concept. It's scary. It's going to be difficult. If they only knew that that's where the healing lies, that's, mm-hmm. where, that's where everything you ever wanted for your health, your weight, and your life lies in this concept. But because there is so much confusion around certain foods because, and again, I love all the plant-based doctors, but they're not food addicts. They've never been overweight. Mm-hmm. So when they say, yeah, a little salt's okay, a little sugar's okay, a little flour's okay, it's okay for them. But if you're the person that's overweight and struggling and having cravings, it's not you. So you have to know who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that you're absolutely correct about that. And I think what happens when you put that word abstinence in front of somebody their whole life forecasts in front of them. And they're, they're seeing themselves at a wedding, you know, uh, somebody's getting married that they haven't even met yet. You know, like they're just future tripping on yeah. some situation that may not even occur right. and imagining, well, how am I ever going to get through that? I can't do it. It's impossible. They won't even try. Right. right? right. That's why and one day at a time. Came yeah. That's, so I was, that's what I'm getting at. Like the core principle is cheesy and as trite as it sounds of one, one day at a time is so powerful because yeah. when you, Think about it. It's 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 very Buddhist in its nature. It's like, what are you doing right now? Yeah. Like, you know, 
okay, eat the cupcake tomorrow. Total freedom, permission to eat that yeah. cupcake tomorrow. But you know what? When your head hits the pillow tonight, you will have followed, you know, AJ's protocol or right. whatever. Like just get through today, make the best choices that you can and don't worry about yeah. what's going to happen tomorrow. It's so funny. I remember one of my first clients and their, their struggle was cheese actually, which is also another addictive substance. It's an animal product, a processed food, a, the casomorphines, opiate in the brain kind of thing. And they said, well, I can't do this. And I'm like, well, why? They go, well, I can't be expected to go to France and not eat the cheese. Right. It's and, just a story. No, but then I said, well, when are you <laughs> going to France? And they go, well, I'm not. I go, well, when have you ever been? <laughs> to France. They go, I right, have yeah. it. They go, well, do you have any plans like in the next year to go? To, well, no, I, I can't even afford to go to France. But the point was, is addicts, you know, addicts well, are really- Well, you're going to throw up that barrier. You're going to throw up, you're going to think of every reason possible to protect that, that, you know, to covet that behavior pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's addiction in a nutshell. Like that's like, okay, well, yeah, only an addict would say that, right? right? It's yeah. all, I, 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 if I ever have time to write another book, it'll be about some of the excuses that I hear why people can't <laughs> yeah. do this, because that's what addicts do. They make excuses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't have both excuses and results at the same time. Right. Yeah. It's just, or even, you know, take France out of it altogether. And it's just, yeah, but cheese, I can't, I could never give up cheese. And it's like, okay, well, let's, let's dissect that statement a little bit. Like, what are you really saying? Like, you're just, you're holding on to an idea that doesn't serve you and you're scared. You're scared of the alternative and what that might mean for you, but you've actually never trodden that path yet. So you actually really don't know. And you're, 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 you've created this story and you've given it so much power, but you've never actually tested the veracity mm -hmm. of it. You know? And so it's about encouraging people. And I think a big piece of that is, is the empowerment thing. You know, like, had he said something different to you about your weight, it might have yeah. been, you know, a very different story for you, right? So the psychology of this is super important and how you communicate uh, to people. That's the hard piece. That's why I refer everyone to Dr. Lyle, because I'm I'm more like Dr. Goldhammer, like, this is the way it is. Just do it and you'll be fine. And I mm -hmm. and Dr. Goldhammer. Yeah, it's Lyle's not an like, intellectual no, exercise, but you know that as an addict. Like yeah. it's not it's not the information. Right. That's not what catalyzes change. You know, it's so much more complicated and nuanced than that. Yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, most addicts don't want to give up their drug. Yeah, of course. And then who, it, it who would. Yeah, it's course. like your best friend. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so. I think often you have to hit rock bottom. You know, in my case, and I forgot to mention this, this was also a subset of the meeting Dr. Goldhammer. When I broke my knee when I was 50, uh, almost 50 years old in February of 2010, I, you know, I was 165 pounds and I was too fat for crutches, or at least I couldn't use crutches. I didn't mm -hmm. have the upper body strength. And I was in a wheelchair for three months and I couldn't take care of my daily needs, meaning I couldn't go to the bathroom myself. And it's very embarrassing. And, and I said, to my, and that was my, that was almost more of my rock bottom than even attempting suicide because to me, having somebody help you go to the bathroom, especially if that's your husband, is the most yeah. humiliating thing yeah. in the world. And I said that I am going to do something about this. I do not want to be that person mm -hmm. that has to have somebody wipe their ass. That was just so degrading to me. And luckily that I soon soon thereafter met Dr. Goldhammer. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. but, oh, the other thing is, is they wanted to do surgery. And I'm afraid, I'm deathly afraid of anesthesia. I had almost died when I was 19 as an allergic reaction. And so that was the other reason because pain is a huge motivator. And here I am working as a pastry chef, you know, you know, eight hours a day and my knee would just swell up. So there was a lot of forces that came together to get me where I yeah, am. Yeah, two observations about that. I mean, the first thing is, yes, pain is... A a phenomenal motivator. Um, it's the only thing that's ever gotten me to change anything, <laughs> you know? And, and, and the tragedy in that, of course, is that you don't need to be in pain to make a change, but it goes back to that intellectualization of everything. Yeah. Like pain can be your best friend because it can be the spark that can ignite you to blaze a new path. Yeah. And so when I see somebody who's in pain or who's in suffering, um, who's suffering, your instinct as a human being, as a compassionate person, is to try to alleviate their pain, mm -hmm. right? How can I make them feel better and more comfortable? But, you know, I think that that often the more compassionate um, response to that is to say, is to not, is to, is to refrain from that instinct and allow them to have that pain moment because that could be their divine moment. Let them know that mm -hmm. you're there for them, that you believe in them, that that you see them, but don't try to ease it for them mm -hmm. because that is the crucible yeah. that can forge 
a brand new life. Yeah. I, and it's know, hard to do that, right? I, I, I have, doc, you know, Dr. Goldhammer's voice in my head. It's too, it's re- he's very compelling. Like he says things with such force and sh- assuredness. And you know, one of the things he says a lot, you know, people will ask him questions. Well, you know, how much, how much meat can I have, doc? You know, like they're, mm-hmm. they're morbidly obese on 20 medications. You know, how much uh, meat can I have? How much cheese? How much wine? And he goes, how fat and sick do you want to be? Uh-huh. And so whenever I'm faced with like a choice that could lead me there, I, I literally hear him saying, that. You know, yeah. how fat and sick do I want to be? Well, I don't want to be fat or sick anymore. I've been both and I much prefer being slender and well. It's so awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, like a lot of people say, well, abstinence isn't sustainable, right? Have you ever heard that? Like, well, it's just mm-hmm. not sustainable. You can't, you know, like how can you be expected to go to a wedding and not drink alcohol or go, you know, here and not have that? And maybe it isn't sustainable for some people, but what I want people to know is the joy of living is sustainable. And when you reverse a lifestyle disease, no matter how difficult it was, and, and when you are in recovery from an addictive substance, the, the self-esteem you feel, the joy you feel, that's sustainable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it builds, mm-hmm. you know, and it gets better and better. Yeah. But it's, it's experiential. Yeah. Like you can't, you know, somebody has to, has to have that experience for themselves. There's no pill. That. There's no surgery for for. Right. That. But we live in a culture that's all about that. Yeah, pill you know? for every and, ill. And, you know, God bless Dr. Goldhammer for saying that we need a little truth talk yeah, here. And uh, it's not about like, oh, take this or it's going to be fine. Like, no, it's not going to be fine, actually. You know, yeah. you're going to have to like get uncomfortable. And you know what? Good things come from discomfort. They're not just hand delivered to you the way that you want them to. And the more people can just acclimate to that reality, I think we'd be better off yeah. as a culture. You know what I mean? All right. So let's get into um, some of the things you get into in the book, like, you know, common subjects that come up, excuses, concerns, yeah. the FAQ of being plant-based, like, what do I do when I travel yeah. or I have a dinner party and like, it's too expensive and I'm going to have to live my life in a kitchen. It's way too complicated. Oh, no. I don't understand it's, all of this. So yeah. like, can we demystify some yeah. of these? You know, it, it I, I recommend the Instant Pot electric pressure cooker or any pressure cooker. Instant Pot's my favorite because the, the truth is, is you, you always, whenever I hear you speak, you talked about how you used to have the window diet, you know, mm-hmm. the drive through It's true that it's never going to be as cheap or easy as going through a drive through yeah. I, I, I agree. Yes. The thing is, is it doesn't have to be as complicated as people are making it. And the, the truth is, is if they... If they realize what they're eating now, let's say they're eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a month. They're eating 30 breakfasts, 30 lunches, and 30 dinners. And I would wager that no one listening is eating 30 different breakfasts every day, even if they're eating a horrible diet and 30 different lunches and 30 different dinners. People find their favorites and their family's favorites and they repeat them. Well, why can't you do that with some plant-based healthy options that you'll like just as much? You like a hamburger? Try my Chipotle bean burger. Delicious. All my recipes are tested on regular people. You can find a few recipes that will become your favorites and repeat them. The other thing is, is if people would understand that the simpler you eat, the easier this is. And so whereas many people are are looking, well, I need a recipe, I need a recipe, you need to learn to eat food. And just having rice and beans over greens and salsa, mm-hmm. it's delicious. That's I, I know you love that meal. I eat that like four times yeah. a week. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Esselstyn loves that meal. It's a deli- I mean, I teach in Mexico. Everybody that lives in Mexico loves that meal. It's food. Think about food instead of recipes. Getting a pressure cooker can take away the argument of time and money because when you cook things like beans and grains from scratch, they're practically free. They're 49 cents a pound, but it also takes less time. You can cook beans on the stove. It'll take two and a half hours pressure cooker, 10 to 20 minutes. So it's true. You, It's like learning a new language. You have to learn a new set of skills, but these are not that difficult to learn for most people. And the other thing is, is you can always get somebody to do it for you. That's what Dr. Lyle does. He has a, a college or a high school student come and do all his prep and then he just takes it out of the fridge, you know? So there, it's, it's, it's harder than people make it. You know what I'm saying? Now, of course, I think the social aspect is always going to be the hardest, especially if you're an extrovert, if you're an outgoing person, because if you're doing something different than everybody else, that could cause you discomfort. You know, if you're the only non-drinker in a room full of drinkers, you, Mm -hmm. you, you know, people look at you like, well, what's the matter with you? Why don't you drink? You know, that kind of thing. And so 
that's, I think, the hardest thing for sometimes people to navigate is the social aspect. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing that 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 leads people out the door. Right, right? exactly. I think that's the deal. You know, the traveling, you know, you travel full time, I travel full time. The traveling isn't that hard because we're eating food. And guess what? They have food in other countries. They mm-hmm. actually have food in airports. I mean, yeah, so maybe I have to get white rice instead of brown rice, but I've been on the road for seven years now to Mexico and Canada and, and the Caribbean, and I've always been able to find food. And when I can't find food, I just take... Uh what do you I got just there? Take this with oh, me. You this got is those. all right. The, yeah, these but are that, like, that involves yeah. a little bit of prep. Yeah. I mean, what what happens with me is people are like, you know, like I'll be on, I'll fly to San Francisco or I'll fly to Phoenix or you know some flight that's like an hour or two, maybe even three mm-hmm. hours, and they're like, well, what did you what did you eat in the airport? What did you eat in the plane? I was like. Dude, it's only like a couple hours. Like, what are you going to starve? Like, I, I had a banana. Oh you know my God. I, mean? it's I know. Like, people are people freak out. They're, they're like, what am I going to do? Like, I'm in this tube. I'm like, you're only in the tube for an hour yeah. and a half. Like, you know, it's going to be scared. okay. They're you know? scared they'll get hungry. That's the other great thing that you learn at True North is that hunger is not an emergency. And when you, even if you go there as a non faster, because you have roommates, unless you want to do a buyout, you always have at least one roommate in a different room, though, but you share a suite. When you see people there that are slender, that are older than you, that are fasting, for 40 days, you realize, you know what, if I I can fly to New York to LA without eating the peanuts, I'm not going to die. But Mm -hmm. for most people, hunger is an emergency. And I think part of it is because they're on such a toxic diet that it almost feels like an emergency because they need to get that next fix of sugar, fat, and salt. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And those microbes in the gut are signaling <laughs> the brain and, and further enhancing that craving. Yeah. I think, you know, beyond the the kind of scientific benefits of fasting, I think what's important about that is it really rearranges your relationship with food in the sense that you begin to understand that this three meals a day thing, like doesn't necessarily need to apply. Like we're, you'll be fine. You know, whatever is going on in your thinking brain or whatever impulses are getting fired, um, those signals don't necessarily need to be heated. You're not going to pass out. I mean, maybe some people do low blood sugar. I don't mean to, you know, minimize those sorts of things. But I think in general, it's important for people to recognize that, uh, that the way that we've been doing it for a long time may not be the best way. I think for some people, it, it really is like a, like a detoxification re- reaction, Rich, because if you think about that, Americans eat over 92% of their calories from animal products and processed food. They're eating a fiberless diet with no micronutrients, and they're always going to be driven to overeat because they're really looking for food with nutrients. And mm-hmm. and so I think part of it really is physiological, that hunger. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting fat, but they're starving. Right, exactly. And so that's what part of, I think, the discomfort is. It's not emotional, it's physiological, because they may have eaten 2,000 calories from a fat fast food restaurant, but their body is starving for nutrients, for fiber. And Mm -hmm. so they're always going to be looking for more food, but then they keep making that same choice. Right. All right. So I got a business lunch. Uh, I got to go meet with these guys. There's a big deal on the line. Uh, They want to meet at at Ruth Chris's steakhouse. Um, I have no say in this. I'm trying really hard to be good, but I need to make a good impression with these guys. I need them to like me. Like- I'm just going to have to eat steak, AJ. No, steak houses are the most vegan-friendly places to eat, believe it or not. I've often gotten healthier. No, I really. I, maybe I haven't been to I Ruth couldn't Chris. tell you the last time I was in a steakhouse. But. Well, I've been to Morton's, mm-hmm. because I, which I don't know Ruth Chris, but I'm assuming. I haven't seen the menu. But in general, steak houses can be the most vegan-friendly places, more so than vegan the chef's restaurants. Like, Finally, well, because here's I can the make thing. something else. If you look at the – think sides. So, so first of all, when you're invited anywhere that you have no control over – Look up the menu. I mean, because if it's a place that has more than, I think, two or three locations, the menu will be online. So first thing, look at the menu, navigate the menu. In general, steakhouses have lots of sides of vegetables. And most of the time, the chef will either steam or or roast the vegetables for you without oil. You do need to sometimes call up ahead to be sure the best time to call a restaurant is during that window where after the lunch lunch lush lunch rush before the Mm -hmm. dinner rush and, you know, call them up and say, look, you know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be difficult. I've heard very good things about your restaurant. I'm going to be there on such and such a date, but I'm on a very special diet doctor's orders, you know, blame it on Dr. Mm -hmm. Esselstyn, can't have a drop of oil and say, is there anything you can do to accommodate me? And instead of saying, well, you know, don't say like, well, I'm a, I'm a whole food plant-based vegan. I can't eat sugar, oil, salt, flour. Just say what you can eat, you know. And so a steakhouse generally can make you a baked potato. Now, sometimes they put oil on it, but you can ask them not to. They can steam you some vegetables. Often they have salsa as a condiment. 
So that's one trick you can do. Navigate the menu. Like I, I've had clients go to restaurants and they go, oh, there's nothing I can eat. But then they realize, hey, you know what? They had a spinach omelet. So then they say, hey, I noticed you have a spinach omelet. Can you hold the eggs? Kind of like that, Jack. Right. All right. Sense. So that's the logistical tactics. Right. But then we have to deal with, with the, people. the social aspect of okay, this. Okay. So this is where everybody's going to be different. And Dr. Lyle has a beautiful lecture on his website, esteemdynamics.com, called The Perfect Personality. And it's going to depend on how agreeable or disagreeable the person is. Now, I don't have a problem with that because I'm not going to eat mm-hmm. somebody doesn't want me to eat. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to be rude or socially unacceptable, but what I might do, for example, one of the strategies I might use if, if I'm in a corner, I, I might say, when I get there, I might say, oh, it looks delicious. I'm so sorry. I had a late lunch. And can I just get a cup of tea? Or, uh, or I might say something. I've used this a lot. I say, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm having a colonoscopy tomorrow, so I can't. <laughs> I mean, I, right. I do that a lot. Or, uh-huh. or I might say, you know what? Oh, my God, I just came from the dentist with a root canal. My mouth is, I mean, there's ways you can do it without offending people for their choices, right? You know, you can order it and then um, excuse yourself to go to the bathroom and come back and say, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I just had the worst bout of diarrhea and vomiting. I, bet. I mean, it depends yeah, yeah. how far you want to right. go. Yeah, so you could tell a white lie. White but lie. if you don't want to lie— um, Dr. Lyle has some interesting strategy yes. around this as well, which is to just present it in a very casual, you know, way to just say, I don't know, you know, I'm trying this thing. I'm trying to do this thing. I know it's crazy. Probably not going to work. Yeah. It you seems know, to be and working. Whatever. Yeah. You know, it's it's doing okay, but like, just deflate it. Don't right. be like, oh, well, I'm doing this and this is the way you, you know, whatever. Like, just try to be as casual and low right. key and perhaps self-deprecating it you know, seems in that to be regard. Working. And that, and that really just diffuses yeah. everything. I've never had a problem. I have I have battles in my mind yeah. about this. Like I I trump it up to be this big thing, but I've always been able I mean now it's, you know, it's like look, everybody knows you don't have to tell white lies anymore. Everybody knows yeah. when they're having dinner with you. This That's is where right. it's going to go, right. right? I mean, same thing with me, so like I don't really confront it anymore, yeah, right. but I I I did have to, yeah. you know, for a long time. So my personal way of doing it is just to is just to be super casual about it. And if you are uncomfortable with that. Like you can say, you can excuse yourself and say, I'll be right back. I'm going to the bathroom and find the waiter and go, Hey, this is what I want to do. Can you do it? Blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. I'm like that way you're having that, con- you're not drawing. I think people don't, they don't want to draw that attention right. to themselves. They don't want to be like that person who's like difficult, yeah. you know, that everyone's going to talk about after right. the lunch or the dinner and just, you know, kind of take care of it in a, in a quiet way. And then just be, you know, you don't have to say anything. You don't owe anybody anything. Do you want to know a strategy that worked for a couple of my clients for whom you know, a, a restaurant meal off plan could have been life or death? We're not talking about somebody that's trying to lose 10 vanity pounds, but somebody that's really in the throes of trying to reverse diabetes mm-hmm. or lose a leg or go on dialysis. Their life is literally on the line. Right. So this, this brilliant lady, what she did when she was in my program, in the in-person program, she had to entertain clients for lunch and she worked near Las Cienega, Restaurant Row. So they always were places mm-hmm. like Lowry's mm-hmm. and whatever. But she really took her recovery from uh, food addiction and diabetes very seriously. So what she did is she called up the restaurant ahead of time because you you know where you're going. Usually they don't it's, you don't just get some mysterious text right <laughs> like at the last minute. Right. This so, is where we're so, meeting. so they knew where she was meeting the client. Uh-huh. She called up the restaurant the night before and said, "Listen." I'm on a very special diet doctor's orders. Would you mind if I brought my food into you? I'd come early, you heat it up and plate it, and then charge me. And the guy says, lady, we do that all the time. And then Mm -hmm. she got what she could eat. Nobody knew. Nobody batted an eye. She -hmm. just said, oh, you know, hey, Frank, I'll have the usual. Oh, so she brought it ahead of time, and then they put it it on the plate? And they charged her for the least expensive entree. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, that's... There's some machinations and some time yeah. invested in yeah. that. But, you know, but not I'm everyone's going to want to do that. But I guess, yeah. look, if you're if you're on your program and this is everything to yeah. you and your life is on the line, like that's a so. So let me ask you that. this: as a recovering alcoholic, would you then drink alcohol just to not make other people of feel uncomfortable? Not. Right. Of course not. So, see, but when you're newly sober, of course. I can tell you, you yeah. know, within the first two weeks of trying to get sober, I was already imagining, you know, this bachelor party that <laughs> I had committed to going to, and there was no way I was going to be able to go to Las Vegas for a yeah. weekend with my buddies and not drink. And that terrified me. Right. So that's very real. Yeah, no, like, I, I don't want to be dismissive I agree. Right. No, and, and I'm yeah. not trying to be dismissive. And now I but, can go anywhere and, you know, I have to maintain my program. Mm-hmm. It's not like I, I, I work at it. Right. But, you know, I can go to those places as need be. I don't seek them out. But, you know, right. occasions arise where I'm in situations I'm not normally in. Right. And I'm comfortable in my own skin. But that is because I've put a huge amount of work. Yeah 
into that, right, to be able to have that gas in the tank and get through those opportunity situations where, you know, normally that would imperil me or somebody who's who has a very shaky foundation right. for their recovery. I'm not trying to be dismissive. What I'm trying to say, and this is where the crux of this disease lies, because most people don't take food addiction as seriously as mm-hmm. alcohol or drug addiction. No one would, if, if people kn- knew you were a recovering alcoholic, it's different if they never met you, but nobody knowing what they know would say to you at a family event or a bachelor party, say, hey, Rich, you got to taste this margarita. I made it just for you, just a sip. People Mm -hmm. wouldn't do that to you. But with food addicts, they feel like, what's the harm? One meal off plan. And just like- It's harder. Makes it harder. Right. One drink, one drunk. You can live your life without alcohol or cocaine or cigarettes. You You can't live your life without food. And so- Knowing what I know now, if I knew then, I would have just been honest with the person and say, listen, this looks delicious, and I'm so sorry, I don't mean to be difficult, but I am a food addict, and and there's nothing I can have here, so I'm going to enjoy the company and have a cup of tea. That's what I would do. All right, so your your kind of road to recovery, you've got this, you've you've premised this, or you've kind of distilled this down to this idea of the seven C's, right? Uh, What are these seven C's? Okay, gosh, I hope I remember now. Well, I I wrote them down in case. No, uh, it's been a while since I gave it. Okay, well, the first C is commitment. Yeah. Absolutely, because you have to have that commitment. I mean, they, there's been research with Harvard Business School that the people that made commitments did better many, many years mm-hmm. later than those that didn't make commitments. Or, or, or you know, sort of like a commitment, sort of like having a goal, but having a commitment, writing it down. You know, being th- specific about being, it. Too. Right, exactly. You're and like, not oh, just I'm going to eat better. Yeah, not just saying I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise. I'm never going to eat cheese again. No, you know, make it, make it, t- and actually having it a time commitment. See, that's why we always do like 21 mm-hmm. days first in my program. We don't tell you that you can't have X, Y, Z. The rest of your life. We're just, like Dr. Lyle says, doing an experiment for 21 days. We're going to do this. And on day 22, if you want that triple cheeseburger, write it on your calendar, you're going to get it. But you're just going to make a commitment. And when you make that commitment public, like we do in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, or if you have a buddy, it seems to be more powerful because then you have accountability. Yeah, of course. So that goes to the community prong of the seven seats. Yeah, that's, I think, number four. And you know, I think community is the one where most people fail. And most mm-hmm. people relapse because you brought that up. That's the hardest for people because of the social pressure. Mm-hmm. And then the second- And a lot of people, mm-hmm. sorry, I oh, don't no, mean no, to interrupt, no. but I think this is an important point. Like a lot of people, like we live in Los Angeles, there's, you know, whatever, there's a million people here to to kind of pat us on the back or, or whatever. But a lot of people live in places where they don't have that community mm-hmm. in their local town or wherever they live. Right. That's why an online community, that's why we created Ultimate Weight Loss to also be online, to help people all over the world with a virtual community, which actually can be just as powerful, although it is always nice to have somebody mm-hmm. in person. All right. Compliance. Compliance is my favorite word. Some people say they don't like it. They like adherence better, but adherence doesn't start with C. <laughs> yeah. But Dr. Goldhammer says the word compliance. That's where I learned it. And it literally means just following a prescribed course of action. And what I love about it is there's no emotion, to me at least, there's no emotion in the word compliance. People, you know, all the time make posts on our private group or call me up and say, I I was bad. I ate a cookie. Oh, I was good today. I ate kale. I don't look at it as like you're bad or you might be bad or good in life, but you're not bad or good based on your food choices. Mm -hmm. You're either compliant or non-compliant. Yeah. You made a choice. Yeah. So, um, Choose to be compliant. You 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 had a mishap. You had a, a slip or a misstep or a, a relapse. Then you can go back to choosing to be compliant in the next meal, whatever that program is. Yeah, I, love I like that, that word. because because it takes this idea of failure and the shame that that kind of goes hand in hand right. with it out of it. Because what happens is people slip or make that choice, and then they beat themselves up. So they've made a second mistake. And then they're like, "Fuck it." And then they go, you know? they, "Yeah." So then they're out, right? right? right. And right. and if you reframe that. And call it by a different name. Yeah. Say, I made this choice. It's neutral. You're not bad or good. Yeah. This is the choice that I right. made. Okay. That allows you to be dispassionate about it and go, how can I recalibrate? Or what led me to make that choice? Like, let's look at that. Let's unpack that. And what do I need to do so that I don't make that choice yeah. again? And it's how they talk to themselves. Because if they ate a cookie and then relapse and they say to themselves, well, now I failed. Now I've blown it. What's the use? Mm-hmm. They feel a certain way. Versus and there's a if, lifetime of energy behind that. Right. Or that if pattern. they say to themselves, oh, I ate a cookie. I was non-compliant. It doesn't have the same charge. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, I wasn't compliant. Right. Oh, well. 
then you'll be compliant with the next meal. All right. Consistency. The next is consistency. As an athlete, you know how important consistency is. Of course, I talk is. about it all the time. Because, I mean, you know, I, I remember, I don't, I think it might have been Doug Lyle, but that it was, was it Kobe Bryant who, there, there's some athletes that they don't just go to practice, like they stay two hours later or come two hours before, you know, things like that. When you do things in the same manner over time without, with little variation and you do them consistently, first of all, you build a habit and then it becomes an automatic habit. But too many people go to True North once a year and fast and they lose some weight and they get off some medications, but then they go right back to the same environment and the same Mm -hmm. way of eating because they're not doing it consistently. So what you do most of the time is more important than what you do some of the time. Mm -hmm. So being consistent with your food choices and your exercise too. Yeah, it's self-evident. I mean, it's pretty elementary, but I think that's, that's the most difficult thing. I mean, right. I think I think it's important to respect momentum. Like mm-hmm. if you have that experience of being a true north or you've done 30 days or 21 days of whatever you're doing, we have this weird human impulse, especially addicts, of trying to celebrate those benchmarks by <laughs> doing the thing that is at odds with what yeah, got yeah. you there. Like, yeah. like, oh, I got a year of sobriety. I'm here's a birthday. Drunk. Here's a yeah. cake. Yeah. yeah. Or here's a cake. Yeah. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I had a kid. Exactly. You yeah. know, and, 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 and trying to maintain, it's those micro little decisions that you're making every day that are truly at the crux of whether you're going to succeed or not. And that's the unsexy part. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, you can create all this, um, romanticization out of like getting on a plane and going to true north and like you're housed and you're taken care of but like you know what are you doing at home when no one's looking moment to moment yeah. hour to hour it's funny that you mentioned the word sexy i had this very um affluent client that came to me and i explained the program and he goes you know this abstinence it's just not sexy and i said well either is your impotence so you yeah because <laughs> well also like nothing you know nothing truly no great accomplishment is like what it takes to build a company or, you know, b- achieve any athletic heights or any of these things. Like it's, it's the unsexy part that gets you there. It's the thing that you're doing, your gr- the grind when no one's looking yeah. that you're doing anonymously, like all of that is what contributes to that success. But you're building so much self-esteem with doing that. That's the thing that's so cool. Yeah, of course. And yeah. when you look back, it's those difficult moments that you recall, right. you know, it's not like that you know, you could celebrate these victories, but honestly, like the value for me, when I look at anything that I've created or succeeded at, like, I remember like the hard time. The effort. The, it's the, yeah. you know, Dr. Lyle talks about that. It's that you're rewarded for the effort for a job well done. Even, you know, I do a lot of these iron chefs and I don't always win, but I don't feel bad when I lose. I, if I, if I know I did my best, you mm-hmm. know? That's all that matters. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So right. the next so one is change, is change. No, it's cooking. I oh, have. okay. Sorry. I don't remember yeah, the order. The, yeah. Well, cooking, <laughs> yeah. you know, it used to be continuing education. Uh-huh. And then I changed it to cooking because we realized that at some point you have to get the food right. And either that means learning a few simple basic recipes yourself, as we talked about, mm-hmm. or having somebody cook it for you because the food seems to be a part that eludes a lot of people. You know, I had a client, 44 years old, who came to me. She goes, how do you bake a potato? And I'm like, oh my God. You know, people have no skills anymore. Like when I grew up, home economics was mandatory in junior high, sewing and cooking. We learn basic you know, skills of the, of the homemaker, which I think men and women should, should learn. So mm-hmm. it's just some basic cooking skills. Right. All right. Cooking change. Change. Yeah. One, you know, right? you know, that saying nobody likes change, but a wet baby, but many people don't change until the pain associated with change is less than the pain of staying the same. People have to at least be willing to change because you're going on a journey here. That's completely different than anything you've ever done. Right. Mm-hmm. Because most of the world is going to continue to eat crap and continue to eat animal products. And so at least you have to be willing to make these changes. You may have to change who you hang out with. Like if you were, when you were an alcoholic, if you had other buddies that were alcoholics, you probably couldn't at no, least I hang- I had to completely change my social right. circle. Or at least not hang out with them at the bar anymore. So you have to be willing to change who you hang out with. If you still go to restaurants, you might have to change which restaurants you go to, how you or how you order. So that's a big thing for people. A lot of people don't like having to change. No, you know? they really don't. No. You know, they want, they want it. They want all the good stuff, right. but they don't want to do those uncomfortable things. Exactly. So AJ's got news for you. Yeah. Got, got, you got to learn to get comfortable <laughs> yeah. being uncomfortable. Right. Well, we talked about community. Do you have anything we, more to say about that you before know, we go on to the I last think, one? I think with community is that if you don't have one, find one. And whether it's my group or a virtual group or even just one person that, that could be a buddy to you online or in person, I think that that is really going to be the most important thing. It would be, very, you know, if my husband didn't support me in this, I don't think I could do it. You know, mm-hmm. if he was just 
you know, drinking beer and eating pizza every night. So even having that one special person to support you. Yeah. So what do you say to that person who is really trying hard, um, but their spouse, their partner is not into yeah, it? I say get, divor- get divorced. Yeah, get divorced. No. So what I, <laughs> I don't, I, I sometimes mm-hmm. I do say that if they're not, if they're sabotaging them. So what I say is then, you know, at least don't have the, these things in the house. So in other words, if you're an alcoholic and your spouse isn't and they can still drink, out of respect to you, they will then drink outside of the home. And it mm-hmm. has to be the same thing with the foods, or we recommend even getting what's called a locked food safe. If your spouse won't support you, it's going to be rough. Now, all the doctors I've interviewed says say that a loving partner will support someone in recovery, or at least should. That doesn't always happen. So if your spouse won't support you, then you have to get it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to do this alone. No man is an island. Yeah. And recovery, I know one person that was a cocaine addict that was extremely introverted, highly intelligent, that was able to get off the drug themselves without rehab, without you know going to a doctor. That's really rare. Recovery is generally done in programs because it really helps you to see that if you climb this mountain, there is a top. You, When you see people like Heather Goodwin who have lost 300 pounds and kept it off, you see what's possible. And that's why I think if you don't have the support at home, you've got to find, as we say, your tribe somewhere. Yeah, a support system is absolutely crucial, not just to see the example, the successes, mm-hmm. but also just to catch you when you fall and yeah. you know who you're going to call at midnight and you know all that kind of stuff is like, I couldn't, I couldn't have gotten sober by myself. There's no way, you know, there's no way. So I think it's super duper important. All right. Compassion. Oh, that's my big problem. That's why I wore this shirt today. That's (laughs) you're not compassionate. I'm not discompassionate, but most of my life as an ethical vegan, my compassion was more for those with fur and fins and feathers and not those so much with skin. Don't like people. Well, it's not that I don't like them, (laughs) (laughs) but I always seem to do better with, you know, the, the, the animals. And so I, uh, I realized that, you know, if I'm going to be successful helping people and if people are going to be successful helping themselves, you have to have compassion for other people at every step of their journey and for yourself, especially when you relapse. This, people, mm-hmm. people, if they understood what an insidious, chronic, progressive, life-threatening disease addiction was, whether it's food addiction or alcohol addiction, they might be kinder to themselves when they relapse. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it, it's, So you need to practice self-compassion. And there's, you know, like your wife teaches yoga and meditation. Those are two of the most beautiful modalities that help you garner self-compassion when you can get quiet and do those more mindful things. A lot of people have compassion for the animals, but not so much for other people. And that's, that's what I'm talking about with compassion. However, there are people that come to this program just to lose weight and really don't have compassion for the animals. And then it's a plant-based program. And then they maybe need to learn to have some compassion for those. So it, compassion is huge, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The piece about self-compassion is super important. You know, somebody who's been in, 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 you know, the rooms of recovery for a long time, like you, see people that relapse, there's chronic relapsers. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those people are under the misapprehension that they can go out and they can always come back, which they can. But, you know, just because you go out doesn't mean you're going to come back. And, and you know, more often than not, uh, you know, I've been witness to those people that go out thinking they're going to come back after a binge weekend and they never come back. They never come back. And, and that's because of shame and because, you know, sometimes they die. And yeah. I've been to a lot of funerals, but you know, a lot of times it's just, they're so mortified, they can't face the prospect of returning to the right. rooms to admit on a public level, like, yeah. this is what happened yeah. to me. And so they would rather yeah. imprison themselves and perpetuate the addictive cycle than have to actually confront that. Yeah. And, you know, it's, that destroys lives. Absolutely. And that's why, that's why community is so important. Addiction is a disease that can only thrive in isolation. And, it, that's just the way it is. And they, 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 they shouldn't feel so much shame. I think that's why with, with shows like yours to educate people that addiction, actually it's a disease. Like you interviewed Dr. Mate. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not like a choice. It's not like we said, Oh, you know, this, this be a great thing to have. It's, it's, it's our brains are wired differently than other people's. And even though it is, it's not a choice, but once we know that we are wired this way, it becomes our responsibility to behave differently if we wish to recover, which is why if I had one message for people that were suffering from any addictions, it would be that abstinence is bliss. It is so much easy to stay, easier to stay in recovery mm-hmm. than it is to continually have to detoxify and withdraw and try to get sobriety again, whatever your addiction is. But, but like I said, I've never met anybody that's 
gone to the top of the mountain or got to the other side that didn't think abstinence was, it's so awesome. If they could just feel what it was like to be in our brains, to have a calm brain and not having cravings for any addictive substance, people would do it, but it is a tough sell. Yeah, it is. So we got to round this out, but if, if somebody's listening to this and they are caught in that cycle and they're having difficulty, you know, confronting their own personal truth or trying to see their way out of it, what is your lifeline? My, well, I think that they, the first thing I would probably recommend is maybe read a book like The Pleasure Trap. You know, that's a low buy-in. Like, you know, what is it, like 15 bucks or Mm -hmm. 20 bucks on Audible and see if that resonates with you, what these doctors are saying. And if it does, maybe considering going to True North or at least having your free consult. You know, there's no, there's no cost in just talking to Dr. Goldhammer to see if it was right for you or having a low cost consult with Dr. Lyle for $75. If my program is right for you, consider joining that. You know, it's not right for everybody because it is... It, it's a it's an abstinence based program, mm-hmm. and that's the thing. People want the results of abstinence without doing the work of abstinence. Mm-hmm. So, and and just just get yourself educated more to see if if you really are an addict. You know, there is no shame in this disease unless you feel that way. You know, that's why we need to bring this out. And I mean, I'm proud to say I'm an addict because once I found out I was, I knew I could recover because there was treatment. Before that, that's when I thought something was wrong with me that I couldn't I couldn't eat a cookie. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Who who eats? You know all these cookies. I don't get it. But once I knew that there was a reason, there was no more shame. Right. So often the fear of the unknown exceeds the pain of the the current situation, right? Mm. And 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 I also so I think it's it's often revealing if you get out a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle and write on one side like all the pain that you're suffering from and on the other side what you're afraid yeah. of. Uh and and really get real with yourself. Um, you know, willingness is something that you can't, you can't will somebody to be willing. They have to have their own, uh, sort of, um, desire to, you know, do that kind of work. Uh, and they either have it or they don't. And my hope and my wish for everybody who's listening, who is suffering is that you do have that willingness because it is that, that will make the difference between you, you know, changing your life and just maintaining stuck in whatever pattern. And you know, you can always go back. You can try sobriety. If you don't like it, you know, you know, it's not, none, none of these programs are court ordered. Well, sometimes I guess they are for some people, but in general, that would be me at first. (laughs) In general, you know, that's why I love the concept of not even a day at a time, but a meal at a time, a bite at a time. You can always choose to go back. And I don't know if I heard this on one of the guests on your show, but you know, they say that the opposite of addiction is connection. And that's why, absolutely. That's why it's so important to find a tribe or at least one person to support you. Awesome. AJ, you're an inspiration. Oh, thank you. I love awesome. you. I, How my, do you feel? I feel great. You feel and good? My, my hairdresser says she's your biggest fan and oh. she was so jealous that I was coming here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a massive fan base yeah. amongst hairdressers. You do. She's yeah. a vegan hairdresser um, too. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Um, Really great. Uh, If you want to connect with AJ, there's a number of ways to do that. The most important thing, though, is check out her new book, Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss. She also has a book called Eat Unprocessed. Unprocessed, yeah. Unprocessed, yeah. yeah. Check that out. And your website, your coaching, your online programs, all all that is on my website. Chef AJ website. Yeah, or eatunprocessed.com. Eatunprocessed.com. Cool. Nice. And you're on all the social networks. And I'm every, stuff, I'm right? I'm Are I'm you speaking anywhere anytime hmm, soon? Or any you that know, kind of what's, stuff? what's coming up? Uh, not, the cruise is until next year. You know, I've been taking a little time off to, mm-hmm. uh, to, to, to get this book done. Am I going anywhere special? Not that I Oh, Rancho La Puerta, where you've been with oh, Julie. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. in Mexico, oh, May, cool. May 5th through 12th. Yeah, I That's, had Deborah on the podcast early days as well. cool. She's amazing. She's awesome. How old is she? must be like- Like, like 95 or yeah, 96 yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's still, she's still she, showing up and doing her. God, she's, she's the goddess. I love her. You know, she's cool. All right, awesome. Come back and talk to me again sometime. Oh my God, it'd be my honor and pleasure. Right. Thank you. Peace, plants, eat unprocessed. And go abstinent. Thank you.